So far we've been looking at hydrostatics, which is what happens with fluids where they're basically just sitting there. And we learned that we had things like pressure increasing with depth, but we'd really like to start to understand what happens to fluids where there is flow involved. So we've got here a sort of a prototype situation. We've got a pipe that has a certain cross-sectional area, A here, and the fluid is flowing at that point at a velocity of V. So we wanted to define a couple of terms just to sort of make sense of um, some things here. So flow rate basically is how much volume of fluid flows past that point per second. So flow rate, which we normally write as Q, is the volume of fluid that goes past a certain point every second. So if we have our velocity in our cross-sectional area, that's actually enough to figure out how much that is. So we know if we imagine just for a second that we have time of delta t seconds, so a certain small amount of time has elapsed, and we want to figure out how much fluid has flown, uh, has flowed in that delta t seconds. So if we look at our diagram here, if we know delta t, that means we can also figure out how far the fluid has flowed, about delta x, just by doing a little kinematic calculation. So we know that delta x, um, this distance, will just be the velocity, v, times the amount of elapsed time, just from what we did previously in the course. So we know that distance, and we know the cross-sectional area, which means we actually know the volume of that little blue, uh, blue cylinder there. So we know the volume, which we'll call delta V, because it's sort of the amount of volume that's flowed in that time, therefore is just equal to the cross-sectional area times delta X, which is just going to be equal to the cross-sectional area um, times V times delta T. So our flow rate Q, all we've got to do is basically divide by that uh, elapsed time in seconds. So the flow rate Q is therefore going to be equal to um, the change in volume, or the amount of volume that's gone past, divided by the amount of time, which is going to therefore just be equal to AV. So I'd make a note of this one, because Q equals AV is the way that we normally determine our flow rate. If we know we've got a velocity and a cross-sectional area, that is the equation that determines our flow rate. So that is uh, in cubic meters volume per second as the standard units for flow rates. If we have something involving liters per second or liters per minute, we will have to do a conversion first to convert to SI units. Um, we also talk about the mass flow rate. Sometimes we want, maybe we'd rather know what mass of a fluid has flowed rather than what volume. So the mass flow rate is similar. Um, we know that we can get a mass of a fluid of volume V by just multiplying by um, our density rho. So we can do that with our flow rate as well. So it turns out the mass flow rate is just going to be the density times the change in volume over the change in time, which is therefore just going to be rho times AV. And that will be in kilograms per second instead of in meters cubed per second. So sometimes we need to know mass flow rate, sometimes we need to know regular flow rate. Okay, so this sort of fundamental idea of flow rate, Q equals AV, what that means is that that flow rate is going to be that number, no matter where we are in a pipe. So imagine now that we've got a pipe where the radius or the, the cross-sectional area of the pipe changes at different points. So I'm going to mark on two points here. Let's have point 1 at this end of the pipe and point 2 at the far end. So my fluid will have a cross-sectional area of A1 at this point and a velocity of V1. And at this point we'll have A2 and we'll have V2. Now, the thing that must be true is that at any point in the pipe, the mass of fluid that's flowing past per second has to be the same, because this fluid is not going anywhere, it's not sort of 
taking off out of the pit, it's not leaking out of the tube, there's no sort of extra hose feeding more fluid in, or anything like that. So basically the mass flow rate at all points in the tube must be the same. Because the tube gets a bit skinnier, the fluid has to go a bit faster to keep that same flow rate, but the mass flow rate is the same at all points. So mass flow rate is the same at all points along our pipe. Which also means if our fluid is incompressible, which means that it's got a constant density and it can't be squished density, then what that means is that the actual volume flow rate will also be the same at all points. Okay, so if you imagine we've got a garden hose and there's a certain amount of litres per minute flowing through it, it doesn't matter if there's a bulge in the hose or if you sort of stand on it um, and make it narrower, the number of litres per minute has to be the same regardless of how big the hose is or isn't. So what that means is at our two points here, we would therefore be able to write down the flow rate here, or Q1, and the flow rate here, Q2, and they would have to be exactly the same. So the same volume has to be flowing at all points in our pipe, no matter how big they are, which if we put in our flow rate equation here, that means that A1, V1, would have to be equal to A2, the cross-section area 2, times the velocity at point 2 in our pipe. So this is our second important equation, and this is called the continuity equation. And it's going to hold in all of our different fluid situations where we have an incompressible fluid. Remember, incompressible is typical of that liquids like water. You can't compress water. Thing, compressible fluids applies more to things like gases, but we're mostly going to just consider liquids, so we'll be using this for all of our fluid examples. Okay, so that's the continuity equation. Second important equation to make sure you write down. Um, and why don't we just go and see what we can actually do with this thing now. So we've got that our flow is conserved. Let's just make a little... Okay, we've got flow along here. The other thing that you might notice, because the, if we look at this little uh, area of volume at one end of our pipe here, if the pipe gets narrower, um, what's going to have to happen is it's going to have to pass a larger volume of fluid, uh, a larger, sorry, length of fluid to get the same volume flowing past each second. So that, that, pa that little parcel of fluid on the left there, by the time it got to the other end of the pipe, it's going to look like much longer and it's going to be traveling faster so make sure we get the same volume uh, going down there. Right, so let's take a look at an example just to sort of put this into a little bit of context. So we have an example here about a water pipe carries 1000 liters per minute, so notice it's a non-standard or non-SI units uh, flow rate, into your street and if the speed of the water coming into the street is 2 meters a second, there's a bunch of things we have to calculate. So let's just see if we can use these ideas that we've been talking about um, to actually do these calculations. So part A is to find the flow rate. And we've been given the flow rate, but we've been given it in non-SI units. So what we have to do is we have to go 1,000 litres per minute, which equals 1,000 times 10 to the minus 3 cubic metres divided by 60 seconds and that means we get the flow rate is 1 over 60 seconds which is approximately put that in my calculator 0 0.167 cubic metres per second. Okay now, now we have to find the cross-sectional area of the pipe and the way we're going to do that is just to use our flow rate definition. So we know that Q, our flow rate Q is equal to the cross-sectional area times V, which means that our cross-sectional area that we want is going to be Q divided by V. So that means it will be 0 0.0167 divided by 2, because our velocity is 2 meters a second, it's been given to us, which is approximately uh, 8.33 times 10 to the negative 3 meters squared. 
Okay. Right, so now we've got our cross-sectional area, and we're going to assume, I think, that our pipe is circular, has a circular cross-section, and we know that the area of a circle, which has radius r, which is what we want to find, we know that the area of a circle is equal to pi times r squared. So for part c, to find our radius, we know that our area is pi r squared, which means that our radius squared is a over pi, which means that r is going to be the square root of a over pi. I don't need to worry about negative square roots because a negative radius wouldn't make sense. So if I put in my, my answers from previously, it's going to be the square root of 8.33 times 10 to the negative 3, divided by pi, 3.1416, etc. Um, and that gives me uh, about 0 0.052 meters, which makes sense. Our, our pipe has a radius of about 5 centimeters. Okay, finally, um, we now want to work out the new speed of our water if our pipe radius um, narrows by 10%. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, what we can do is basically work out the new radius and then work backwards to find the area and to find then to find the velocity because the flow rate will have to be the same. So our new radius is going to be our old radius minus 10% of our old radius, which is 0 0.9 times r, which is about 0 0.046 meters. It's worth mentioning that behind the scenes here, I'm actually using unrounded values for all of these calculations. I'm only rounding them when I'm displaying them to you on the screen here. So that's my new radius, which means my new area is going to be pi times r nu squared, just using my circle area formula again, um, which gives me pi times a new radius squared, which gives me 6.75 times 10 to the negative 3 meters squared. And if you've been carrying through unrounded values, that should come out to be exactly what it is. Okay, continuing on, that's our new area. Um, we now need to find the new speed. Um, we know that a flow rate, which we know, say it's constant, is AV, which means that our speed, let's put the news on actually, so it's going to be A nu times V, which means that our new speed is going to be our flow rate divided by our cross sectional area, the new one, which equals, again, so put it plugging in the flow rate from right at the start. 0 0.0167 divided by 6.75 and I will get a new speed of about 2.47 meters per second rounded. Okay, so my speed has increased um, from 2 meters a second up to um, 2.47 meters per second. Let's do one more example, and the last example we're going to do is to do with stenosis. So stenosis is when you get a buildup of plaque in an artery, which causes it to get narrower. And we now know that if we have a narrower tube, then basically to maintain the same flow rate, we're going to get an increase in blood velocity. But this question has been posed to us slightly strangely. It says if the area of an artery narrows by 33%, what is the percentage change in the speed of blood flow? Okay, so this is kind of tricky because we haven't been given any actual numbers to work with here, but let's see how we can actually make sense of this. So let's just say that we have before, we have a speed of A and a velocity of V, and then after, let's just say we have a speed of an area of A nu, which is going to be narrower, and a speed of V nu. And in both cases, because of our, conservation, our continuity equation, we're going to have the same Q. So that means that AV will be A nu, V nu.
Right, so we want to know the percentage change in the speed of the blood flow. So let's work out our new area of our artery in terms of the old one, because we know that it's narrowed by 33%. So this means that our A nu is going to be the old radius minus 33% of the old radius, which turns out to be 1 minus 0 0.33 times A, which is 0 0.67 times a. So 33% narrower translates to multiplying the cross-sectional area by 0 0.67. Okay, um, so we want to do something similar for v. So we want to go that v nu is equal to some kind of thing that we don't yet know times v. So that's kind of what, what our end goal here is. And then we can work out what the, what the percentage change is from this. Okay, so let's plug a plug our new value of a nu into our continuity equation again. So I've got a nu v nu equals a v, and I'm going to replace my a nu with 0 0.67 times a times v nu is equal to a times v. I want to get v nu by itself, and a neat thing is going to happen, which means that those so I'm going to divide by 0 0.67 times a. So v nu is going to be a v divided by 0 0.67 a. And those a's will cancel off. They'll just go away. So this, is, this shows you that this, the answer to this question does not actually depend on what the, uh, the um, original radius a was. It'll work no matter what it is. And so my v nu is 1 over... 0 0.67 times a. Let's see what that actually is. 1 divided by 0 0.67 is about 1.49. Okay, and just like I did uh, previously um, in, this, in this sort of step along here, I can turn that into a percentage change by going that's 1 plus 0 0.49 times v which equals, if I expand that out now, so notice I've just taken the 1.49 and turned it into a 1 plus something. That means the new uh, velocity is the old one, v, plus 0 0.49 times v. So our new velocity is 49% faster. Okay, so see how that's worked out? So whenever you've got a question involving these percentage changes like this, you can follow a similar procedure to, to work that out. And the neat thing here was that the A's cancelled out, which means that the question did actually make sense, even though we were not told um, any numbers for these things. Okay, that's a good place to leave it, so we'll see you next time.